Yes, is our um, new colleague who we're very pleased to welcome, uh, Professor Rado Dimitrova. Um, and he is coming to us now, um, at his PhD from Minnesota. He's coming to us now from Western, where he taught for 17 years. Um, he also worked for the UN for 20 years. Uh, he represented the U uh, European Union in international climate change negotiations and was actually involved in negotiating the Paris Climate Agreement. So there's really nobody better to talk to us about this topic today. And we're just so pleased to have uh, Rado as a colleague in the department also and take this opportunity to welcome him yet again. So thank you, Rado, for agreeing to do this. Thank you for this very kind introduction. Uh, welcome, everyone. Um, we live in very exciting times. Um, in the past years, we have seen a number of dramatic changes in the world, including the pandemic. Um, and one of the most significant global transformations that we have the privilege to be witnessing is actually an, a global transition to a clean economy. So I do think that it's a privilege to be able to see history in the making. Um, I do believe that we are at the early stage of a global transformation of a magnitude that is quite unprecedented. Um, and today, um, I'd like to um, discuss several topics that are related to this. The first one is the Paris Agreement and what exactly it is. Um, I will uh, comment on the legal status and the status of implementation of how things are going. Um, and also to discuss policy developments in the government realm around the world, as well as you can broader economic trends that are not necessarily related to government policies, uh, that really converge in a very clear direction. Um, and eventually, I want to clarify the role of the Paris Agreement in contributing to that global transition to a clean economy, uh, because a lot of uh, social scientists, scientists immediately are interested in the reasons behind processes of such magnitude and such significance. Um, I do have to apologize, well, on behalf of the Sony projector, <laughs> I decided to make some unilateral decisions in how to, <laughs> how to represent my work. Um, and um, apparently it cuts out some of the text. Um, some of my talk is based on my personal observations in climate diplomacy. Um, as Laurel uh, pointed out, um, I have participated in UN climate conferences uh, since 2004, uh, right when the Kyoto Protocol was coming into force. And since 2009, I represented the European Union, um, getting increasingly intimately involved with the negotiations and eventually having a very active role um, during the the Paris Conference that produced the Paris Agreement. Um, eventually, I um, was hired by the European Commission to revise their negotiating strategy, and that led to an appointment uh, as a co-chair of a new task force on political communication in the climate realm for the European Union. Um, had the opportunity to work in Brussels, um, to be uh, in the kitchen of European institutions, as well as uh, UN negotiations. Um, and I, what I'd like to do is bring some of that um, insider perspective um, and sort of clarify a few things that are, I think, very important that are very easy to miss um, if we just rely on the mass media. Um, <clears throat> the Paris Agreement um, came out of a conference that lasted two weeks in two, December of 2015 highly publicized event, uh, about 40,000 uh, people attended it, 20,000 of those were government delegates. Um, security was unprecedented because it was three weeks after major terrorist attacks in Paris. And then you had the entire political elite essentially in the same location, same venue in the, the Bourget, a suburb of Paris. Um, the conference got a lot of attention, but it was actually only the tip of the iceberg. It was the culmination of a four-year process of formal negotiations under a legal mandate. And before those four years of negotiations, we had another several years of uh, formal talks under other legal mandates that failed. 
And so it was really coming in the wake of a remarkable series of spectacular and highly publicized failures to reach a climate agreement. It's been one of the most difficult processes of the international discussions on the world stage. A lot of things happened in Paris. Um, I took most of these photos myself. Um, there were heads of states, um, a very large number of them. Um, there were, um, at the time, the Canadian uh, environment minister was brand new, Catherine McKenna, um, was you know, part of a government that had come to power just a few weeks before Paris. Canada was relatively unprepared to engage in real negotiations. Um, and <clears throat> as usual, there were about a thousand different meetings within those two weeks, actually. It was a highly complex event. There are a lot of stories that I uh, wish that I could uh, have time to share today. Um, stories about how, for example, on the last night when we had the full text of the agreement, the United Kingdom almost collapsed the entire conference by refusing to, rep to support the, the text. And if they had stuck to their guns, the EU would not have been able to officially uh, support it. And that would have led to the collapse of the, the conference. Very interesting uh, conversations took place. Um, then, <clears throat> when we walked into the final plenary session, uh, where all delegations had to essentially state whether they uh, are taking it or leaving it, without the ability to renegotiate, uh, the meeting um, was postponed for about an hour and a half, and everybody was sort of there hanging around um, with my European colleagues, um, Minister of the Environment of Finland, uh, Minister of the Environment of Luxembourg, head of delegation of Belgium, um, next to me. Um, and we genuinely didn't know what was happening. Uh, we knew that somebody must have gone against the treaty, but we couldn't know. And then Peter gets a text on the phone, looks down and says it's the US. And in the last minute, um, the US took issue with this text, uh, where in the treaty, developed countries um, basically pledged to, are uh, committed to take the lead by undertaking uh, economy-wide emission uh, reductions. And the United States said, we will accept the text only if we make one change, you know, a single word. And that word was should instead of shall. Mm -hmm. And in international law, that changes entirely the character of the commitments because it makes them uh, yeah. essentially far less binding. Okay. And so uh, this was unpalatable to most delegations who wanted a strong treaty, uh, including the islands, the European Union, but uh, reluctantly they accepted it as the political price to pay uh, to have an agreement. So what exactly is this current treaty that uh, now defines the global response to climate change? Um, just to sharpen your attention, mind you that through all those years, of, of, of repeated failures, governments didn't engage in environmental negotiations. If you talk to diplomats, nobody was naive enough to say, oh, this is an environmental issue. They were very clear and very explicit in saying, we are negotiating the future economy. So given that this is now the centerpiece of the global climate regime, uh, again, it will be a, a, a very crass mistake to treat it as an environmental treaty. It is one of the most complex international policy agreements ever negotiated in recent history. It is extremely difficult to interpret because it's an experiment. It's a hybrid agreement that combines the so-called top-down approach to international law, where you have a treaty and then you expect everybody to comply with it, with the bottom-up approach to climate governance that gives a lot of freedom to um, national and subnational uh, jurisdictions to define their actions. It has weaknesses, it has strengths, it has elements that are very mandatory and elements that are so non-binding that they're virtually meaningless. It is genuinely difficult to characterize and assess the strength and the importance of the, of the treaty because of its complex nature. Um, and crucially, the short-term uh, immediate effects, political, legal, economic, are very different from its long-term uh, ramifications. 
the treaty uh, stipulates that um, the international community uh, is now seeking to reduce, to limit the global temperature rise above pre-industrial levels to, quote-unquote, well below 2 degrees <coughs> centigrade. And to pursue efforts to limit the temperature increase to 1.5 degrees centigrade. This is because for the first time in history, the majority of governments, you can tell that it was exactly 106 out of the 193, who actually said 1.5 should be the goal. <clears throat> Utter failure for the European Union and other strong leaders to achieve um, you know, quantitative goals on global emissions in the treaty because of the United States and other players who didn't want to have any numbers, the treaty basically says when you're going for a global peaking of emissions as soon as possible, which, as you know, doesn't really mean anything because it doesn't apply to anyone. <clears throat> the treaty um, makes it completely obligatory for every government who has ratified it to come up with domestic national plans for mitigate, mitigation, which means emission reductions. They have to. But at the same time, it gives them almost unlimited freedom to define what that, those, those plans are. It's totally a blank slate. That was seen as a mechanism to entice governments to actually support it so that they don't feel intimidated. One of the most crucial provisions is in Article 4. And the European Union fought very hard to get that. It's the cold salt ratcheting up mechanism. And they got it. And what that really means is that once the government is in the treaty, they have ratified it, they're part of the treaty, and they have submitted the national plan, the clock starts ticking, and every five years, they have to send a new domestic plan. And every consecutive plan has to be higher in ambition than the previous one. <coughs> So essentially, the treaty locks a progression of policy making into, uh, in, into, into the text. And what that really means, it, we, we might say, is that even though it, it's a fairly weak agreement, once it brings governments in, everybody becomes locked in a very long-term process of ever accelerating climate and energy policy towards more and more stringent emission reductions. Um, so, what happened? What happened was that um, at, in the last hours of the Paris conference, all major emitters in the both developed and the developing world expressed support for the treaty. And over a remarkably short period of time after the Paris conference finished, ratifications, you know, piled up. And as a result, not only the treaty came into force, but it came into force with lightning speed. And the numbers are truly astonishing. Virtually everybody has ratified the Paris Agreement, including China, India, the United States, except for several countries that account for a mere 4% of global emissions of greenhouse gases. And obviously, these you know, countries are, are not significant economies. Um, we don't really see that kind of level of support for any international treaty very often in international law, in any issue area. We're not talking about only the environment. Uh, but th this is a very, very important political signal. Yes, a lot of these governments ratified because the treaty gives them so much leeway and so much freedom of action. But it is nonetheless quite remarkable. And what is more interesting and important is that not only they ratified, but they, that many governments rolled up their sleeves and actually started uh, developing and implementing uh, domestic policies in compliance with the treaty. However, I'd like to point out that this process of, of uh, the domestic processes of policies to, on climate and energy started before Paris. Consider that in 2007, 
this was the um, the number of, of countries who had climate legislation were very, relatively few around the world. To pick any favorite shade of blue. A mere five years later, the map looked considerably different. And again, this is um, it's a little bit difficult to see uh, given the technical issues, but um, we see um, uh, a marked increase with the sole exception of Canada, which had moved from, um, well, never mind, never mind that. Yes, Canada was the only country that moved in the opposite direction, you know, from having climate legislation to not having it. <clears throat> when you add one more, one more period of five years, the global map got transformed again, even further in the same direction. And, all, and by that time, Paris had entered into force, obviously. Um, but I, what I want to point out is that uh, the, 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 something happened, started happening on the global scale before the Paris Agreement. Clearly, we know very well that there's so many different possible reasons for that. When you're dealing with public policy of such um, significance, of course there will be a multitude of factors that are contributing to that. It, you know, vast multi-causality. But I, what I do want to flesh out is something that may not be, you know, quite familiar to um, to many people, and that is that there was a crucial time in the UN negotiations on climate change when several delegations began to table arguments that were completely arcane and. Com totally bizarre at the time. Around 2006, the EU started basically um, waging arguments that eventually persuaded many delegations. Now, when we talk about persuasion, we have to acknowledge that in the in diplomatic studies, persuasion is actually the terra incognita of diplomacy. And the reason for that is we don't um, have a lot of, typically a lot of information about the micro dynamics of negotiations. And the key, key question is when governments meet to negotiate a treaty, what do they actually say to one another? What are the actual words, right? What are the discursive strategies? I mean, there are conferences, we assume that they try to change each other's minds and affect policy and the preferences, but how? What do they actually utter, right? Um, and some years ago, I got a, a large shirk grant uh, to and that lasted for four years, and uh, I studied um, the negotiating strategies involved, and I drew a typology and studied the, the effectiveness of the different approaches. Um, and um, and one of the interesting things that happened in climate diplomacy is that around two thousand and five six. The EU started saying something that was completely contrary to conventional economic wisdom at the time. After decades of everybody assuming that climate policy is extremely expensive and damaging to the economy because you have to dig into the energy sectors, the EU essentially started saying that no, climate policy presents a win-win solution to a number of problems. And the main idea was that if you take, if you, uh, if you pursue climate um, policy, you're actually strengthening the economy, that there are actually benefits to the economy. Around the same time, only one other delegation would say that, and that is the Republic of Korea. I interviewed the head of the delegation who was there for many years, and he claims personal that he, he should get the personal credit for introducing this, um, this whole idea. But the EU was much more serious about this, and they institutionalized this concept of win-win solutions. It became the centerpiece of their negotiating strategy. And in order to, to back, back it up, they commissioned a high level, uh, the UK government commissioned a high level study that became published by Cambridge University Press and was known as the Nicholas Stern Report that for the first time supplies the numbers that actually shows that indeed climate policy can actually lead to a growth of GDP, right? And that in any case, the cost of effective policy would be negligible. So, 
just another illustration when the UK Prime Minister spoke in 2009 in Copenhagen. I'm just trying to give you a sense of how you know these ideas are actually applied in, in real discourse. Um, he didn't really speak about climate change. He didn't speak about the environment. He said to the developed world, I say environmental action is the most powerful engine of job creation in an economy of need of millions of jobs. This is 2009. To the developing world, I say the technology now exists to gain the dividends of a high growth economy without incurring the damage of a high carbon economy. Um, so some of these uh, legislative changes around the world are actually driven by a very different kind of uh, economic planning and, and rationale. Um, consider uh, the, 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 that um, one of the most telling facts is that most of those changes, the proliferation of climate policy actually occurred primarily in the developing world. It's significant because the developing world at the time did not have international legal obligations under any treaty to do so. Right? Only Annex 1 countries in the Kyoto Protocol, which is, means industrialized countries, had legal obligations. Which means that something else was driving that process of policy convergence. Now, let's focus a little bit on nowadays and, and more recently what's been happening after the Paris Agreement came into force. Um, the past year and a half, in particular, have been very, very exciting for anybody who, who, who follows this topic. Because, again, within about 12 months, a number of economies, uh, governments have declared plans to decarbonize their economy by the middle of the century. That is a grand statement, obviously, it's still a statement, and we don't know uh, what is going to happen. But 18 out of 20 countries uh, a couple of years ago had carbon pricing schemes. Now, if you travel back, you know, 15 years ago and somebody told you that that would happen, it, it would have been incredulous. You, you would have been incredulous, right? Um, all kinds of developments anecdotal in the transportation sector, electrifying transportation. All of the major automakers are making are busy making electric cars now. Um, several countries, uh, including industrialized countries, have declared that they actually want to get rid of the, and the cars with com internal combustion engines altogether uh, relatively soon. Those include Japan, the UK, France, and Scandinavian countries. I want to focus a little bit on some of the key countries around the world and, um, and, and key regions um, in, in to sort of give you a sense of how deep these developments are going. Uh, by far the most advanced um, climate and energy um, policy plan is in Europe. Uh, the first time they had uh, such a package that was binding on all 28 countries at the time was in something that came into effect in 2008. And since then, the EU has only been increasing its, its own ambition. Now they plan to, uh, to go for climate, climate neutrality by 2050, which simply means that you have net zero emissions of all greenhouse gases. Um, they also recently moved yet one more time <clears throat> their threshold of going for 40% reductions to 55% reductions by 2030. Um, and just to give you a context of, of this, um, um, today e European emissions are approximately 26% below 1990 levels. For the same time period, the European economy has grown with about 55%. And so we actually became the first region to decouple emissions from economic growth. And that experience reassured them that it's possible and they've been stepping on the gas ever since. Um, solar energy, stepping on the solar energy. What's that? They're not stepping on the gas. On the solar That's right. That's right. Yes. Touché. Very nice. 
Um, so again, what, what are some of the reasons? First of all, uh, there is a very strong public concern in Europe about cl with climate change. Uh, there is clearly an environmental uh, concern there, and it is related to truly devastating impacts uh, that they have been suffering. Um, I don't want to go deep into that. Uh, but more importantly, uh, European policymakers genuinely see this as a way to rebuild their economy and make it more competitive on a global scale. Uh, and they're, they, they are not hiding it. They're very explicit in official European documents, uh, as well as in political declarations. And they're stating um, things of, of, along these lines, that the Paris Agreement is the key element in modernizing the European industry. So what exactly is the clean economy that um, policymakers are really envisioning? Well, it's simply based on uh, energy efficiency, saving uh, money from energy waste, renewable energy, alternative sources of energy, as well as alternative transportation, and ultimately decarbonizing society. These are the basic parameters. Uh, the benefits that uh, that Europeans and um, other communities have been expecting after they've done homework. Um, essentially, um, so-called co-benefits are energy security, disengaging from politically uh, difficult regions such as the Middle East and reducing imports from there. Industrial innovation, innovation um, the increase of economic competitiveness, particularly of, of exports. Job creation, uh, they, and, and here the numbers are in the millions, essentially, of new jobs in the new uh, cutting techno technology sectors. And also, um, reducing the health, health costs um, because of improved uh, air quality at the local level. Uh, combating climate change basically is um, completely compatible with com combating local air pollution. And, and this is a significant problem, as I pointed out in, in my class, uh, was it yesterday? Um, globally, uh, the number of people who die of local air pollution every single year is about 8 million. Um, so it's not a negligible problem. Um, the European Union, uh, the European Commission uh, is extremely active in, in backing up all of their plans with, uh, with data uh, and with projections. Uh, a long time ago, even, they expected that by pursuing that path, they will actually grow the economy by an additional 2%. Um, they expected by the middle of the century to have up to tri tri 3 trillion euro of savings only from the reduction of oil imports. Another 200 billion euro were expected to be saved from healthcare costs. Um, and what is quite interesting to me is that uh, eventually other countries began justifying their own policies and plans <clears throat> in the same kind of economic terms that can be traced back to 2006-07 when the EU started tabling what at that time were truly bizarre, crazy ideas. The uh, Japanese uh, government uh, came up in last October uh, with an announcement that they, they also plan to decarbonize the economy. Um, and they justified it again with, um, an, with the need for economic growth. And um, they said, um, the Prime Minister said, assertive measures against climate change will lead to changes uh, in industrial structure and the economy that will bring great growth. Um, China, um, actually, four weeks before uh, the Prime Minister made that announcement, uh, China took everybody by surprise uh, during a session of the General Assembly. Nobody, really nobody expected that. Um, they announced uh, that they will go for carbon neutrality by 2060. Carbon neutrality is different from climate neutrality. It, it, um, it means net zero emissions of carbon dioxide, not all other, not all greenhouse gases, but only carbon dioxide. But it is still, um, you know, a, a measure of decarbonization. And 
I'm going to skip this because we don't have time uh, to, to watch the, the, the video. Um, Japan had pursued for, for many years a policy goal to stabilize their emissions by 2030, which means that they will, the, the emissions are not supposed to grow beyond the 2030 levels, whatever those are. Um, various studies uh, show that they are clearly on track to achieve that, that it's a very realistic goal. Um, they also um, are reducing their carbon intensity by 60 to 65%, also by 2030. Um, and, you know, I really, yeah, it's really unfortunate that uh, the technology is playing tricks on us uh, with the hertz and the resolutions, but um, try, try to imagine, <laughs> visualize. Um, and in addition to their carbon neutrality, what, uh, what happened in 2018, they changed their constitution. Did you know that China changed its constitution? 2018. And they officially uh, included uh, the phrase ecological civilization. We're going to be building an ecological civilization by 2035. Um, So presumably that is what their new paradigm of economic development is. We know from a recent history that um, China is very slow to make public announcements internationally. They are almost paranoid about any kind of international commitments and obligations, even self-imposed. But we know the track record is very clear. Once they say, say something, it's, it's done. You know, they have very, very solid um, uh, record of um, implementation and following up. <clears throat> it's not surprising. Their announcements are not surprising. If uh, you have observed their behavior in investing, uh, you will know that uh, they are now today the, the undisputed global leader in renewable energy investments. Uh, those have grown very steadily uh, from non-existent in 2003 um, to <clears throat> Uh, hundreds of billions of, of, of dollars today. Um, that chart matches also what's happening at the global level, that it is not just China. Uh, renewables are you know, one, one of the most booming <coughs> sectors for investing. And if you, even if you break it up into regions, you will see again that in, pretty much in every uh, region of significant industrial capacity, uh, you will see the same trend all the time. The global investments today are about 2.6 trillion. Uh, with China being number one, the US being number two, uh, Japan number three. Uh, if you count the European Union as a, a single unit, then the EU would be second to China. Now, to step away from the government uh, realms of, of policy development and policy implementation, um, we also need to pay attention to some market forces and economic trends. Um, in 2020, um, for the very first time in, in, in history, actually the investments in renewables exceeded investments in fossil fuel energy. Sorry, uh, in oil only. I'm not sure how it will work out if we count coal and natural gas. Um, <clears throat> This was related to a trend over the previous several years uh, where oil investments had been declining even before the pandemic. Quite considerably so, uh, with about um, you know, one third between 2014 and 2016. At the same time, governments of the G20 countries were reducing their subsidies for, uh, for oil, for fossil fuels in general and those declined by half uh, from 248 to 127 billion. Again, in the same, in approximately the same period of time. Mind you that this started again, this data sort of reflects the period that began before the Paris Agreement was in force. Um, in the three years between 2014 and 16, the largest uh, oil companies actually re reduced massively the number of jobs involved. 
And yes, of course, living in Canada, we cannot fail to see the contrast with the official discourse at the time, right, when uh, the oil industry was still kept on a pedestal because of jobs and because of economic interests. Arguably. Uh, the pandemic only accentuated those trends. They deepened and accelerated what had already been um, unfolding. The global energy demand absolutely just plummeted, floundered, um, and uh, investments in oil and gas continued to fall. The whole energy sector basically was pummeled, you know, on a, globally, everywhere. The only one thing that went up in the energy sector during the pandemic was the continued increase in investments in renewables. Nothing else. Everything else was downward. <clears throat> and um, obviously this doesn't, none of that boded well for, the, for Canada's oil uh, in Alberta and elsewhere. And the projections are very clear. The, the future is not very bright. Um, I've had, I had once a dinner uh, with um, the person representing um, Suncor in, uh, in Canada, uh, together with also other uh, leaders in the industry. And uh, he was very open, open and honest about it. I was actually surprised how, how straightforward he was. He says, we just can't, we have real difficulty finding markets now. Um, you know, we all the trouble with Keystone, and so they're, they're not even hiding it. They used to be hiding, you know, the realities, but um, not anymore. Um, whether this leads to actual uh, changes in emissions is actually a much more difficult thing to assess. There are countries whose emissions are continuing to grow. There are countries whose emissions are slightly declining. Uh, generally, um, generally, the reports are essentially we don't have enough progress in emission reductions and uh, the temperature increase is, is, is exceeding any goals under the Paris Agreement. So total pessimism on the environmental goals of the treaty. Um, but it's still notable that in countries uh, like the United States, uh, Germany, France, the UK, Switzerland and Canada, uh, emissions have actually uh, decreased all the time. So, um, <clears throat> I think that it is fair to, to look at that, that global picture um, and to observe several patterns. The first one is that there is a, a very clear, uh, almost stunning proliferation of climate and energy policy around the world in a very brief, historically brief period of time. Asia and Europe in particular are committed to constructing a clean economy. There's no doubt uh, in my mind about that. This is not a process that is reversible now. It is likely to continue in fits and starts, right? There will be setbacks, there will be changes of mind, but the overall direction is very clear uh, and this is an irreversible process. And the reason why it will continue is because of uh, clear economic reasons for that. They're not, the Europeans and, 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 and the Chinese governments are not uh, you know, trying to save the poll theirs. Right? That's not why they're changing their constitutions and, uh, and making those grand uh, plans. It is just part of a new paradigm for economic development. Um, the fact that the current pledges are not sufficient to keep the temperature rise be well below 2 degrees, ironically, is actually going to only accelerate all of those trends because it will create a pressure within the Paris Agreement process to increase in ambition and uh, scale up those plans. Um, and so um, I want to just finish by saying that um, we really are beginning to witness uh, what is likely to be the most fundamental socioeconomic transformation in human history that, has, that is truly on a global scale 
and part of a conscious decision-making process. That is unfolding remarkably fast in historic terms. And yes, it is a particularly complex political and socioeconomic process and clearly multi-causality rules here, right? But I hope that it is helpful to understand some of the kernels of those massive changes and how the international discussions on climate change and the concrete arguments that were tabled, as well as the data that was supplied in those negotiations, eventually contributed to the evolution of policy preferences around the world that led to some of these changes that we're witnessing. Thank you for your attention. If you'd like uh, some details, I have a recent publication um, at the, uh, that is a policy brief that details some of those changes. Thanks.